Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. We are moving on to um, Exodus. We last week we took a look at the building of the tabernacle, um, and this is a diagram I've done to show that the tabernacle plan actually shows layers of truth. Now, God told the Israelites in uh, chapter 25 to start building the tabernacle. Um, but in chapter 24 of Exodus, the, the people actually uh, gave their verbal agreement to uh, confirm the covenant with God. So chapter 25 is when uh, God starts telling the um, the Israelites what are the offerings to bring for building the tabernacle. So constructing the tabernacle, we see that God gives instructions to build the tent. And that we can see in uh, chapter 25, verse 8. Okay, can somebody help us to read Genesis, uh, Exodus 25, verse 8? Exodus 25, verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Okay, read on verse, 29, uh, verse 9, sorry. Okay. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Thank you, Jack. Okay, so we find God giving instructions to build the tabernacle, which is basically a tent. And uh, he says, make it and all the furnishings, all the things that will go with it, uh, exactly like the pattern I will show you. And so you see that when God showed uh, Moses the pattern, right, you have the whole, all the different parts of the tabernacle. Each part actually has its own special use. And then at a different layer, at a different layer of truth, each part has a, another meaning and another significance that you can see I've written in red, okay, uh, to refer to other Bible verses to connect to these parts. So what God asked from the Israelites is willing contributions. God asked them to give willingly. Uh, and even when giving willingly, God doesn't ask them to give any kind and anything. There is no compromise of quality and no compromise of fidelity to the construction. That means God asks for the best. Okay? No compromise of quality. God asks for the best. And fidelity to the construction means God wants them to make the tabernacle exactly according to his pattern because there is a the the parts have important meanings so we need to be faithful to the instructions of the parts we see that moses and the people actually carry out god's instructions practically word for word and so when you are doing your bible reading from chapter 36 to verse verse 8 to chapter 39 verse 31, okay, uh, the instructions God gives for them to build, they actually follow word for word. And that underlines the importance, underline the importance of obeying God's instructions. Uh, verse 9, as Jacqueline read, exactly like the pattern I will show you. So God gives instructions to us also to build the church temple of God. That's for Christians. For Christians, we build the church temple of God and whatever kinds of materials. We build with quality and we build with obedience to the very specific instructions. What happened with Moses and the workmen is they constructed the tabernacle 
and it demonstrates the importance of building the church exactly. Building the church exactly as God instructed. So there is a fulfillment of God's intentions if we obey God to build exactly. We also see God giving them the moral law. Uh, last week, we explored the moral law. If you remember, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's just one example. And the moral law requires duty, which is carried out in terms of responsibility. While worship demands dedication, devotion of love. So we need two parts. God's law needs two parts. The moral law where it says this is right, this is wrong. We have to be responsible to carry out the duty. But we need to couple it with worship. when that is where there is a dedication and a love for uh, what is behind the law when we do it. So we don't just do it as a duty, as a responsibility but we do it because there is the love devotion there. So the moral law involves what we are to do as well as what we are not to do. Okay, now the worship activates. Worship activates the God focus of obeying, obeying the moral law by requiring willing love. So we do it not just because it's our duty or responsibility. We do it because we are willing with love. And what kind of love? Love for God as well as love of God. So we are representing God. We are representing God in the love behind the actions that we do, the right and wrong actions. So that is very important. Uh, we don't just do it because it's our duty. We do it because there is love behind it. So we can see uh, there's a Exodus version of the building of the tabernacle. And for us as Christians, there's the Christian typology or application. What does it mean for us? There is actually a parallel. For the Exodus, the Israelites, they have to dedicate their treasures and give willingly. And you see that they have to give God precious metals like gold, silver, and even their bronze, which is uh, important for the building. Then they have to give yarn and linen, good quality, goat hair, ram skins, sea cow hides, precious stones and gems and they have to give their skill. For the Christian equivalent, the church is also built on willingness. Yeah. There's a willing commitment, love, and effort of those who give their best to God and on behalf of God. So that's where you talk about the love for God, the love of God. Yeah. Okay. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11 shows that there are different kinds of gifts, service, working. Just like these are all the different things that the, the Israelites bring to make the tabernacle. God, in this case, gives them spiritual gifts, service, and working for them to surrender their time and their skill. And to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That means it benefits everybody. When you build the tabernacle, or when the Israelites build it, it benefits everybody in how they can worship. Same for us when we build the church. Whatever we use to make the church is for the common good. And each member is called to contribute to the building of the church, which is the body of Christ. And that is also known as the bride of Christ. You can see these references referring to the church as the bride of Christ. Then we see also in Exodus, uh, they 
dedicated their talents. Okay, so we see the, the workmen, which include uh, Bezalel, Oholia, skilled craftsmen, and women. They all dedicated their talents. So they brought to uh, the tabernacle building, they brought their ability, their knowledge, uh, their ability to teach people, and they do the work as God has commanded. You see that in Exodus uh, 36 verses 1 and 2. That's what they did. They did the work as God commanded. And we see that God asked the people to give willingly. And then what they actually do is they bring more than enough. Chapter 36 verse 5, that's that section. You see that Bezalel and Oholia had to tell Moses to ask the people to stop bringing. Stop bringing because they have given more than enough. They are willingly giving to God and giving more than enough. For us, as the people in the church, that is the kind of attitude that we should bring as well. Okay? So in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, uh, if we can read that, somebody help us. Somebody help us to read Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Thank you. Okay, so the whole measure of the fullness of Christ will be when the church is built up according to God's pattern, as they built the tabernacle following God's pattern. Right, so God gave them apostles, prophets, and all these uh, people who are, in that sense, God's gifts to the church, right? Just like God gave Bezalel and Oholiath, all these skilled craftsmen, the ability to build the tabernacle. So God gave the church all these, right? All these functions so that people can build the church. And the church as the body of Christ can be built up to unity and maturity. Then in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, Paul says, we proclaim Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, that is presenting everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor. So he's working very hard, struggling with all God's energy, which so powerfully works in me, is working to the purpose to present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, this word perfect in Christ doesn't mean that they are sinless. It is the same word in Greek that is the word used for maturity. I use color code to show that these two words are actually the same word in Greek. Yeah, talios. Talios means mature and can be translated as perfect as well. And you know, we said the meaning of maturity is we are made complete in Christ. Yeah, We don't lack anything in our spiritual uh, growth. So to present everyone complete, not lacking anything in Christ, right? We are built up to unity and we are complete, not lacking anything in being, being built up. Okay, so this is the building of the church, yes, just as in the Israel, Israel, uh, Israelite story of Exodus, they are building the tabernacle. And it goes on, 2 Timothy 3.16, 
all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That's what the Bible is used for to grow the church in this way. And we see the people bring more than enough in the Exodus story. And in the New Testament, we also see the Macedonian churches. Paul was um, gathering offering to go and help the poor in Jerusalem. And so he went to the Macedonian churches to ask them for their offerings. And they gave out of extreme poverty. They are already very poor, but they gave. And they gave beyond their ability. So that would be to say that they have very little already for their survival for their survival needs. They already have very little money. And yet they are giving out of that little, they are giving so much that whatever they have left might not be enough for themselves. So you can see that people give more than enough and they give beyond their ability for the Macedonian Christians. But their principle was they gave themselves, they gave themselves first to the Lord. That is their principle. They dedicate themselves to the Lord and then to us, then to the Christians in keeping with God's will. That shows that, you know, they have that love of God in the correct perspective, in the correct view. And because they love God in the correct way, they are able to love their poor Christ fellow Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, so they gave themselves first to the Lord. They love God in the right way. And then they gave themselves to the fellow Christians, loving your neighbor as yourself. So they are very poor, but still they are willing to give and share so that they can meet other people's uh, uh, need, even though they themselves were poor. Okay, so we find this is the building of the tabernacle in Exodus and in the Christian setting that is also the equivalent of building the church and these are things that we can think about how are we contributing and showing the same attitudes as both sets of people exodus as well as the new testament church for ourselves we can reflect and see if we are doing what these people did in the past then the next thing we want to look at is actually the functions of the law. Why did God give the law? What was the purpose of the law? Okay, so if you remember, I said that they came to Mount Sinai and this is the place where they're learning. They're learning how to be a people of God. Yeah, through the law. So the functions of the law really is to make them into a people of God. How does that work? The first thing they do is they formalize their relationship with God through a special agreement or covenant. Okay, so they have this covenant with God, which just now I said in Exodus chapter 24, they have already given their verbal agreement. And then after they are given their verbal agreement, Moses went up the mountain to get from God the Ten Commandments, the tablets, to get the written contract. Okay, they Moses went up to the Ten Com uh, to Mount Sinai to get the written copy of their verbal contract. So the functions of the law is to formalize their relationship with God. The next thing is to reveal the character of God. Okay, so they, they have a relationship with God through their uh, covenant. They, that's where they receive the law, which says these are what is expected of them as God's people with that covenant. And this law, the expectations and so on, reveals 
what God is like and what his people are to be like when they imitate and become like him. They have to be like their God. So that is the function of the law, teaching them in the things that they are to do and not to do, how they are to be like God, imitating and becoming like him. The next thing is that the purpose of the law, the law functions is the law brings a commonality that bonds them together as a people of God under God. Just like, you know, for us in Singapore or any other country, you have the laws of your country that will bond you together as citizens of that country. Yeah. So your laws will bring you together closer as, oh, we are one people, one nation, one Singapore. So for them, they are one people, one nation, Israel, a people of God. So this law has bonds them together as that people of God. Next is the law is to teach them and teach people, all right? They are supposed to be a witness for God, just like Christians are supposed to be a witness for God. So it's supposed to be teaching people, but first of all, it's for themselves. Teach particularly God's people how to maintain a covenant relationship that separates them from the practices of the people around. Last week, we talked about, you know, the... the the moral law of uh, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that part. That's an example of how they are different from the other people in the, in the nations around them. Because other laws of those nations, they may not focus on the value of a person. Yeah, we, we've talked about the value of the person. God's law, you can see that it values people. Whereas the law of the nations around them may not value people uh, consistently. Yes. So this is this law of God teaches them how to maintain the covenant relationship to show that they are different in the kind of laws and kind of people they are. And through this, they can be prepared or equipped to teach others like. You know, to, today in the world, we can share and teach non-Christians what God is like. Teach others to also build a covenant relationship with the true God. For example, God would not want us to practice uh, uh, abortion. Okay, so we have a covenant relationship with God that we will not kill our babies when they are in, in, the, in the mother's womb. So the covenant relationship separates us from the practices of abortion around us. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we are not supposed to practice the same thing that other people in the world do. Yeah, and other examples could be like, for example, uh, LGBT. We have a covenant relationship with God that separates us from LGBT practices around the world. Okay, and people who are willing to, we can be, uh, prepared to teach them to also observe this covenant relationship with the true God, not to be gay or lesbian or queer or whatever it may be, or bisexual and so on. So teaching God's people to maintain a covenant relationship that makes them different from the practices of people around. Then next, number five, the function of the law is to guide them Guide them in the choices they make as individuals and as a believing community toward holiness. Yeah, so the law is actually showing them, yes, how God is different and how they should also be different. The distinctive, the differentness or the holiness of God. And they should be like as his people and how they what they should be like as his people what they should be like as God's people, different, okay? So just now was teaching 
teaching them how to maintain. But here, number five is guiding them yeah, to make the choices as individuals and as a community to be different. And by this, others will know they are a people of God, disciples of Jesus for the New Testament. And that's where we have John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 34 to 34b to 35, where Jesus said to his disciples, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So you can see here their distant, distinctive differentness, holiness, how they are different like God. If they show that by loving one another, just as God loves them, then people will know that they are Jesus' disciples if they love one another. Okay, so they can show that they are different like God uh, in the choices they make. So the law guides them. Love one another. Okay, so all of it is good so far, but there is a, a kind of a negative. Number six, the law reveals sin. That's to say that the law, through the law, they know that there are different things that anybody might do would be considered sin. Do you remember what is sin? Do you remember what is sin? Fall short of the standard glory of God. Very good, that's right. Okay, thank you for that. Fall short of God's standard, fall short of God's glory for heaven, right? How to live in heaven so that there would never be suffering and pain and hurt and offended people and so on. So reveal the law reveals sin in the sense of there are things that they should not be doing. So for example, you must not kill, you must not steal and things like that. So it reveals what is wrong God's, that falls short of God's standard and they must not do. So this is the, the part of law that shows what is wrong and negative they should not do. And this shows God's will of what men should do regarding God when they honour and uphold his values and his lifestyle of relating to and treating people. Yeah, so the laws that says do not do this, do not do that, will tell us how to relate or treat people. Don't kill people. Don't uh, be jealous of people and covet people's things and so on. Okay? It reveals sin. It reveals the wrong things that we should not do. So it shows us all the right good things that we should do. And it also tells us things we should not do. What to do to people and what not to do to them and ourselves. Okay? So law, one thing is to deter, to reveal sin and tell the people who might be sinful, right, that you should not. It is to deter this, this kind of people. Because even among God's people, there can be people who, who might think of committing crime and doing wrong things. Seventh purpose for the law is to demarcate boundaries. So God draws a line. To say, okay, these are the things you do, you will receive blessing. And these are the things you do, which will end up with consequences or curses. So it draws boundaries of blessing and curse. Okay, and that you will find uh, a whole section in Deuteronomy chapter 28. So I'm, I'm telling you uh, throughout from Genesis, uh, Exodus to Deuteronomy, right? The second to the fifth books of the Old Testament, there are things that God says which will be blessing and, and things that they should not do because it will result in curses or consequences. So God gives the boundaries. You want to be blessed? These are the things to do. You don't want curses and consequences? These are the things to avoid. Okay, so it demarcates boundaries of blessing as well as protection 
from sin and the consequences, uh, both physical and spiritual curses. Okay, curses are actually just consequences. And finally, the purpose of the law, the functions of the law, is, uh, is to lead us to Christ. Many good purposes for the Israelites. And the final one is the law is meant to lead us to Christ. And you can see that in Galatians 3, verse 24, where it says, so the law was our guardian, kind of like holding our hand, guiding us what is right, what is wrong, what is blessing, what is consequence or curse, right? It's guiding us uh, and it's telling us these are right, these are wrong. So the, guide, the law guides us till Christ came, then we might be justified by faith. Okay, so to say that the law is actually bringing us to the point where we know the law shows we cannot fulfill the requirements perfectly. Yeah, we really, you know, we don't have that kind of, the purpose behind the law is love. We don't really have that kind of love to fulfill it perfectly. Yeah, that is what ultimately it means. Leading us to Christ shows that we cannot fulfill the requirements of the law perfectly because we don't have that great love of God. Yeah, so our love for people is not so great. That's why Christ is the only one who fulfills the law perfectly and we need him to be redeemed and justified in our Christian growth journey. Yeah, so we can't be perfect by observing the law because the law just now, you say, it reveals what is wrong and we often do the wrong. It gives us the boundaries of blessing and consequences or curses and very often we end up with the consequences because we cannot fulfill the law perfectly. And that's why Jesus has to redeem and justify us. So the law leads us to Christ knowing that, okay, number this law, this law and that law, we are not doing it or we are not doing it correctly. We're not obeying it. So with the functions of the law, yeah, all these things that we can't do, we can't, you know, you see, we cannot imitate the character of God perfectly. So we need Christ. So now talking about fulfilling the law. Law is given for us to obey and to fulfill. Uh, but actually, just now, if you remember, we were talking about uh, responsibility, you know, moral responsibility, duty and responsibility. And then there is the other part about worship where there is dedication and love. Okay. That's exactly where the law shows that we cannot, we cannot do that dedication of love. We might, we might be okay with certain value, uh, duty and responsibility, but we don't have enough of love to do it uh, perfectly. And that is why, that is why, when we see what the Ten Commandments means, it actually sums up the law. And Romans 13, 8 to 10 shows that love fulfills the law. Which is back to saying what I said just now, we don't have that great love. Our worship and devotion, there's not enough love power in us. We are just doing a lot of it morally as duty, as responsibility. So when Jesus came, he didn't come to abolish the law. He didn't come to cancel the law. Yeah, He's, He didn't say that the law is not needed. He didn't come to cancel it, but he came to fulfill it. And that's Matthew 5, 17. Okay? And the word fulfill, when you say Jesus came to fulfill the law, is to complete the law and obey the law. Okay, so he came to fulfill the law, came to show us the complete way that we follow and obey the law. 
And how he did that, he fulfilled the law. Uh, and so just now we look at three kinds of law in uh, what God gave the people. Jesus fulfilled the civil law. And he did that as a Jew. He was born as a Jew. That means a people of God set apart to be different. That's what the Jews or the Israelites are supposed to be. God's people set apart to be different. And for us, that will be Christians as well. Okay? So God's people uh, following Abraham's um, descendants would be Jews. Today, Jews. Last time, Old Testament, Israelites. Yeah? And for those who come receive Christ, that will be Christians. That's us today. So Jesus fulfilled the civil law, meaning as God's people, okay? He fulfilled and obeyed the God-honoring laws of the land of Israel, okay? Where, where he lived, or today, the land of the law where we live as Christians. And we uphold our witness as God's kingdom citizens, and we are a testimony of God's good laws in our best interests. So Jesus fulfilled the civil law as a citizen of God, in other words, as a citizen in Israel, and for us, we fulfill the law as God's kingdom citizens. That's what we are meant to do, fulfill the law as God's kingdom citizens. And of course, that is the part of the law of our land of Singapore. Okay, so there is a physical uh, country and there's our spiritual country that we belong to. Jesus fulfilled the law by the civil law by being that serve that uh, by being uh, the the person who fulfills the civil law, the law of his land. Then the next thing is he fulfilled the moral law. That means the laws of good, right or wrong. Okay, and he fulfilled it as a witness of the standards of goodness. So he did not sin, in other words. He fulfilled the standards of goodness and holiness of God. He didn't fall short of that standard of God. Okay, so he fulfilled the moral law as a witness that God's standards are actually good. God's standards are actually holy. Okay. And God wants us to love our fellow men just the way God loves us and the way we love ourselves. Jesus fulfilled that moral law. The good standards of God, the different standards of God where we can love God and we can love our fellow men like we love ourselves. So when we think about it, the morality, the moral law of God, morality of God is of a higher standard and higher requirement than mankind's morality. Why? Because it has a very high standard plus it never changes. God's morality of right and wrong, of holiness, the standards, very high, but mankind's morality, the standard changes with what people say, oh, you cannot be dinosaur. You have to make progress with the time. Yeah, you have to make progress with the time. So people's kind of standard of right and wrong start moving up and down according to time. Yeah, so last time, sexual sin is wrong. But now, sexual, sexual actions uh, is up to you, up to each person to decide. Okay, you can see that there is a, they call it progressive, they call it change of time. And this is what it is, that it is not the high standard or requirement of God. It changes. Yeah. But God's absolute morality applies for all the people who belong to his heavenly kingdom. Okay, so this is the, Thing that is uh, different about God's moral law. His moral law is absolute. That means it doesn't change and it's always the same. Yeah, whether thousand years ago or now or even 500 years from now into the future, God's 
moral law is absolute. It doesn't change. So God's moral law applies for all people as long as they claim to be citizens of God's heavenly kingdom, his moral law applies to them. And that is contrasting with, that means different from the shifting standards of a subjective world and self-oriented world. More and more, the world is thinking of just self. Yeah, and everybody has their subjective standard, different standards from, from other people. Yeah, whereas God's standard is absolute. One standard for everybody in his kingdom. So Jesus came to fulfill and obey the moral law of God that does not change. Thirdly, Jesus came to fulfill the sacrificial law, making sacrifices that restore and reconcile relationships with God and between men. Yeah, so Jesus made a sacrifice of himself. Yeah, he sacrificed himself. He sacrificed himself so that our relationships with God and man can be restored and healed. Okay, yes. And in the same way, he calls his disciples to carry their own cross like him, making sacrifices. Yeah, we have to be prepared to make sacrifices of ourselves and die to self, just like Jesus died on the cross. Yeah, so carry their own cross like Jesus and die to self in order to uphold God's standard of holiness and blameless relationships. So sacrifices are made to mend, to heal and restore strained and or broken human relationships. That is the sacrificial law that Jesus performed as the Lamb of God to restore and reconcile relationships, all the human relationships with God and with each other. And these sacrifices often involve offering of self as a living sacrifice where we may have to give up our self-centered rights and desires. Yeah, give up our self-centered rights and desires in training, preparation. So we prepare, when we do that, prepare for the eternal and perfect heavenly kingdom. So Jesus came to not cancel the law, but he came to complete and obey the law fully. And that's how amazingly he fulfilled it. And he fulfilled it because he did it with love. Yeah. So he, he had love to fulfill the civil law and obey it. He had love to fulfill the moral law, the high standards of God. And he had love so much that he sacrificed himself. Okay, and so that is where in uh, Leviticus, God will teach the different kinds of sacrifices. Yeah, I, I mentioned them briefly, but the different kinds of sacrifices show the different ways that uh, we actually restore and reconcile relationships with God and with people. Okay, they, they are the literal sacrifices uh, of the Bible as given as law in the Old Testament. But the New Testament, Jesus teaches us carry our cross and make our personal sacrifices to die to self, where we give up our self-centered rights and desires. And that's how, if we are prepared to do that, then we will not end up fighting with each other. If, if Two parties are prepared to carry their cross and die to self, give up their self-centered rights and desires. The two parties should be walking God's line and not choosing their own, their own ones. And that is how their relationship with each other 
will therefore be healed and restored. So Jesus shows the sacrificial law. He was able to complete and obey it perfectly. And so Jesus was able to do all these things for us, okay, for our benefit. That's why he is ultimately the Lamb of God. Okay, so we have finished looking at the tabernacle, right, the parts of the tabernacle with the spiritual significance. What you read when you look at uh, Exodus 25 all the way with the priestly garments starting in 20, chapter 28, okay, and uh, and so on, 29, 30, and you, you'll see that these are given as literal details, but the spiritual meaning, I've just explained it briefly over, over this period of uh, this lesson. So when you look at Exodus chapter 31, this is the people, just now we mentioned Bezalel and Oholia, uh, giving, given the ability by God to build the tabernacle. So for us, the Christian equivalent, as I said just now, is when God gives us uh, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, and the other spiritual gifts, manifestation of the Holy Spirit, where if we are building for the common good, then as a whole, the Christians or the body of Christ will may be presented as mature, okay? mature, not lacking, not that we are sinless, but we are not lacking in the right kind of self-sacrificing attitude towards each other. Okay, and you can see the Christians in the Macedonian churches, they, they are willing to make sacrifices of what they have to help other people. Okay, so that is the basic um, idea that we can get from Exodus and then the Christian meaning and significance application. So we move on now to chapter 32, Exodus. All right, And in this chapter, the story shows us that the unfaithful heart of the Israelites is revealed. Okay, The unfaithful heart of the Israelites is revealed in this incident of the golden calf. Yeah. Now it started with Exodus 31, just, just one verse in ahead. Just one verse before Exodus chapter 32. Uh, the last verse of Exodus 31, which is verse 18, you see that when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. So God used his own handwriting to write the covenant terms, the contract terms for the Israelites at Mount Sinai, okay? The tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God, meaning God used his own handwriting to write on the tablets to give to Moses, in that sense, the written contract. Chapter 30, 24, I said just now, was the oral agreement to the contract by the Israelites. Now God gives Moses the written version of the contract in the two tablets. Okay, so that was in chapter 31, verse 18, the last verse. And so in chapter 32, we see that uh, Moses was up in the mountain with God. What happened during the time? that Moses was up in the mountain. So this chapter will show us that while Moses is up on the mountain to meet God, to receive the written contract of the covenant, and this contract the people have agreed already, uh -huh. and, and this was what God already told them in Exodus chapter 20, yeah? chapter 20, uh, the Ten Commandments, last this point, do not worship idols, okay? God told them not to make idols. What happened is the people up there, Moses was getting the 
the written contract and there at the bottom of the mountain the people were straying and breaking the contract terms by worshipping a golden calf. So what it shows us is all it takes is a period of 40 days for them to be right by themselves without Moses to restrain them and they quickly break God's command reading. Yeah, it's as fast as that, 40 days. Uh, the number 40 tells us a time of testing. So in a time of testing, they break God's commands. They disobey God's contract terms. Okay, and you can see a little more information in Deuteronomy 9.16. Can someone help us turn to Deuteronomy 9.16? Deuteron Deuteronomy 9, 16. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. Thank you, Jack. So this is where uh, Moses revisited this uh, incident. Uh, to the second generation that was going to enter the promised land. Okay, and Moses was telling them that as a people of God, they sinned against God and they did the opposite of what God told them not to do. So this story shows us a big group of people with their ringleaders and vocal descending individuals, you know, people who have things to, to say the opposite of what the leader says. Yeah, there are people who go against what the leader says. These people need, you know, this big group of people, they need a strong and unwavering leader to keep them on course with God. A little bit like pastors like that. Sometimes the pastors have to be strong. Otherwise, the church members, you know, church members, they can be quite naughty, excuse me, about obeying God. Yet, how many people appreciate having a strong, uncompromising leader? You see, they need a strong, uncompromising leader, but how many people actually appreciate having one? People want to be heard. They want to have their way if they are self-centered about what they think or what they want. And they want to have the freedom to voice and hold their own opinions on what worship or what God is like. Yeah, a lot of Christians, you know, they have their own, they have their own perception of God is like this. God is like that. That's why I am like that. You know, they want to have their own version of God. In other words, they want to make God in their image. Yeah, a lot of people want to make God in their image. So they don't really want to obey God or the leader or the pastor yes and it also shows a big group of people can easily affirm and support each other in the wrong but you can also equally have the people who affirm and support each other in the right way it can swing both ways yeah uh, you can have people to influence others in a wrong way or influence others in the right way all it takes is for someone to make an ungodly decision and then the big group will move in the wrong direction. Yeah, it just takes somebody who is daring and loud mouth, loud enough, okay, uh, opposing enough to make the decision and then people will all start following. Wrong direction towards destruction and that is even though they are all God's people. Now, it may not strike us as possible but we can still practice idolatry and then we superimpose God onto our idols. Yeah, so we say God is like that and the, the, like that is actually our idol while we are still under God's leadership and covenant. 
So that's what's happening with the people in this chapter. Okay, they really, really take God for granted and they want to make their idols. And then they say, okay, this is God. Our idol is God. So, okay, so chapter 32, looking at the actual story, the people saw that Moses was taking a long time on the mountain, 40 days. So they told Aaron, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Okay, so their behavior shows that people are impatient and have a short memory. 40 days, they cannot take it without seeing Moses and they easily forget Moses. Call him this fellow Moses. They have forgotten all that God and Moses have done for them. And now that Moses is gone for a long time, we know it's 40 days, they refer rudely to him as this fellow. It's kind of out of sight. Don't see him out of mind. I don't care about him. No thanks, Moses. No thanks, God. Yeah, all that God and Moses have brought them through. No thanks. Their hearts are not thankful and it shows they are not loyal and not faithful. They have forgotten that they agreed to a covenant with God. You see, forget so easily. After all the wonders they have experienced, they put God and Moses out of their minds. And now they put Aaron under pressure to comply with their request, or is it demand, to make idols to lead them. Come, make us gods who will go before us. Their behavior also shows the human propensity. You know, we are, we are quite, we're quite prone. We're quite prone to stray. And we also need to see things. As a human race, we depend very much on our sense of sight. We want and we need to see the tangible reality of who or what we worship. We want to see God. Yeah. And we also want to see the people who lead us. To people, there's this principle, seeing is believing. I see, then I believe. And that's where Jesus tells Thomas, you know, the disciple Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John 20, 29. Right? So Jesus tells us where he is concerned, faith is important. Okay? Faith is important. Even though we don't see, but we know this is God's truth. Yeah? We don't see God, but we know it's God's truth. So faith is important there. So Aaron got their gold earrings and made a calf-shaped cast idol for them. And then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. You see how disrespectful they are to God. Yeah, God brought them through all the hardships and now they say the cast idol, These are your gods that brought you out of Egypt. They have a total disrespect for God. They sacrifice to the idols the offerings that God told them to sacrifice to him. Yeah, God told them, your sacrifices, sacrifice to me, but they take the sacrifices and offer to their idol. They use God's covenant instruction to worship not him, but an idol. So you can see, they can do very Christian things, but it is not God. It is not God that they are doing it for. They're doing it for themselves and they are putting an idol in front of their in front of their goal. So we see Aaron buckles under pressure. He cannot resist them. He's alone. And as Moses' partner, assistant leader, he does not rebuke. He does not rebuke or correct them because he is fearful of the crowd. So here is the lesson for us when we are flexible, you know, we like to use the word flexible about the right and wrong things of God and we give in to people because we're trying to accommodate them out of fear. We need to realize that we don't fear God as much as we don't, as much as we actually fear men. Yeah, okay. We don't fear God as much as we fear men. 
Yeah. So we have a need to feel secure about ourselves. And we are trying to get the security from inconsistent people by giving in to them, even when they want us to go along with something God does not want or God does not approve. This one, God already told them no, and yet they are doing it. And Aaron wants to feel secure, so he gives in to them. So Aaron built an altar after he made the, the idol. He built an altar for the calf and he declared a festival of worship. The next day, the people sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings and they sat down to eat, drink and indulge in revelry. These are the things that the pagan groups around them are doing. So they learn to copy them. Yeah. And what we can see from here then is Aaron's experience shows the importance of leadership qualities when preparing for new leadership. Oops, sorry. Okay. Leadership qualities when we look for new leaders. A leader has to be firm and not fearful of group pressure in a group situation. We tend to be fearful of pressure from a big group. On the other hand, if we are part of the group, if we are part of the group, we can actually put pressure on individuals like our leader or our, or our assistant leader. You see, we, we can be on both sides of the coin. The question is, how do we behave? Yeah, how do we behave? Whether as the, the leading side or we are the, the follower, follower side in the group. We can collaborate as a group to put pressure for good if we seek to fulfill a godly purpose or a purpose with a greater goal outside of ourselves. That means we think about other people. We think about what is good for everybody, a goal outside of ourselves, not just for me. On the other hand, we can also use group pressure to coerce someone, force someone, pressurize someone to give in to our self-seeking pursuits. Right? So we can, we can kind of like pressurize people to give in to what we want rather than what is important. So Aaron released the pressure on himself. You know, he tries not to feel too pressurized, but he does that by complying with the people now. But what happens where he complies now is he puts himself under God's judgment later for giving in to them, right? He bent to their demands. Can someone help us look at Deuteronomy 9.20? Deuteronomy 9.20 And the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. But at that time, I pray for Aaron too. Hmm. Thank you, Mac. Okay, so actually, God wanted to destroy Aaron. But thankfully, Moses interceded for him. Uh, but, but Moses was not successful in interceding for the larger group. That's why later on, a uh, number of people died. Like Adam who blamed Eve, it is useless to comply with wrong. And then, you know, go along with the wrong thing. And then after that, blame the people that we comply with when we come under God's judgment. No use doing the wrong thing that people want. And then after that, we blame them. Yeah. So the Lord told Moses the people he brought up out of Egypt had become corrupt. Quick to turn away from what he commanded them. You see, they, he told them, don't, don't make idols. And yet they make idols. And they made a calf idol to bow down and sacrifice to it, saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who have brought you out of Egypt. So this is God and Moses up in the mountain. We see that God knows everything, right? Even though God is in the mountain with Moses, the people downstairs are doing all the nonsense. God knows. He tells Moses how the people have corrupted themselves. See that word, corrupted themselves. So they have done something bad to themselves with their worship. He is aware of their sin. He is angered by their sin. 
and he will punish them. They have given the credit of God's salvation work to idols. So they say idols save them, not God. So they distorted the truth and then they turned away from God. For us, we can see that Christians can also distort God's truth. Yeah, by constant and almost total focus on blessings. You know, we, we, we can be focusing on blessing, blessing, blessing. The life of God is not about the material blessings we receive. They are given as an indication that God can and does bless, but these are more accurately intended for eternal destiny. Blessings that are non-stop are actually for eternal destiny. And they are given here on earth to encourage our faith and obedience to the true God and his purposes. So we should not the whole life on earth be talking about blessing, blessing, blessing. Yeah, focusing on that. Because we learn to focus disproportionately on them for our life. What about the struggles that we people face? Yeah, we have to teach, we have to learn and we have to we have to apply the principles when we struggle with issues, when life is tough. Yeah, I cannot always be talking about blessing and then people expect blessing, but when life shows tough issues, we cannot handle it. So Christians can also distort God's truth by just focusing on blessings and not on the very important aspect of struggles and problems. Yeah, that's something for us to be mindful about. Then, in God's anger, he wanted to destroy the stiff-necked people, very stubborn, stiff-necked, and make Moses into a great nation. So God was angry and wanted to destroy the people, and he said, Moses, I will destroy them, I will make you into a great nation. Now, before we talk about that part, we can see that Embedded in the Lord's response is a spiritual principle that when people worship idols, it defiles them and makes them liable for destruction. Okay, so worshiping idols actually corrupts. Just now we saw the word corrupts or defiles and makes them liable for destruction because they become worthless like rubbish. Yeah, good for throwing away. But God is not willing to totally destroy people so that his great master plan is spoiled. No, God, God made us for a purpose. He didn't make us to destroy us. So he offers to make a great nation through Moses instead of the stubborn people who have already begun behaving like Pharaoh even before they received the written contract of their covenant. Yeah, you see that their hearts and behaviors are just like Pharaoh, unchanged, stubborn, even though they have experiences with God's miracles. Christians are equally capable of showing stubborn hearts and behaviors like Pharaoh and the Israelites, if not careful and disciplined to remain consistent towards God. Okay, so you can see Pharaoh was quite terrible. But you can see that God's people can be equally like Pharaoh. Terrible. Yeah. So the attention turns to Moses. Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. And he said that after God saved his people from Egypt with power and might, mighty hand, the Egyptians might say he brought them up with evil intent to kill and wipe them off the face of the earth. So he asked God to turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on your people and remember his promise to his servants, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob to give their descendants the land as their inheritance forever. So Moses also tried to pray for the people besides for Aaron. Okay, the part about praying for Aaron, we only know it in Deuteronomy 9. But here in Exodus, we don't see it. But he was not successful in praying for the, the rest of the Israelites. But what we see is to Moses' credit, he does not fall into temptation. See, God wants to make him great, you know. God wants to make him into a great nation here. But he didn't fall into that temptation. He does not seek to be made into a great nation for himself. 
and let the people perish. She didn't say, oh God, you want to make me into a great nation? That's good. I'm all for it. Let those people die. He, he didn't have that kind of attitude. What is important? He has learned to care and be unselfish. He has learned to be more like God, less like his humans, human nature's attitude to seek personal interest. This is Moses' growth. Okay? You see, after all that time of working with God, serving God, this is the growth of Moses. So the question for us, after we have been with God, do we show a unselfish growth? He intercedes for his people based on God's character. You are not an evil God. You didn't save the people with an evil intention to kill them. Reputation, God's reputation. The Egyptians will claim that he's not a good God. Next one, number three, is God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God promised inheritance to our fathers of faith, and that is to be inherited by us. It is our privilege as well as our responsibility to ensure we stay on course so that we can receive the promise and the fulfillment. Okay, so Moses intercedes based on God's promise. And his response teaches us that intercession is important. So it's important to pray for people. And Moses shows a picture of Jesus' intercession. God relents in his judgment when self and self-interest is put aside or sacrificed to intercede for his people. That is called love. Yeah, We put aside self or self-interest. That is called love. And so God relents when we show love. And this is the Lord relented and he didn't kill the people like he threatened. So God relents from punishing his people because Moses is faithful to intercede for their welfare. There is that quality, remember, faithful servant. Moses cares for God's household, not his personal interests and wants. So this is, you can see the, the servant heart of Moses. As a leader, okay, so Moses went down the mountain with Joshua and the two tablets, the commandments. He broke the tablets out of anger when he saw the calf and the dancing. He burnt the calf crushed it to powder, he scattered it on water and made the Israelites drink it. And then he went to confront Aaron. What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? So he is confronting a very difficult job to do. As a leader, Moses has a young man following him. That's Joshua. Joshua follows and serves Moses in learning, training, and gets experience and wisdom from observing Moses. And he sees Moses exercising faith in God and how Moses handles situations, problems, and people. So future leaders are trained from the life experience of effective leaders that they shadow. And that ensures continuity of effective leadership. So as a God-centered leader, Moses does not tolerate the idols and the wild behavior of the people who imitate the ungodly nations around them. And he confronts Aaron for the pressure they put on him and his own sin in giving in to what they want. You see, when Aaron gives in to what they want, he is actually allowing a lot of people to perish. Think about that. He's allowing a lot of people to perish. So Moses made it clear that what Aaron did was a great sin because a lot of people will perish. So he does not try to sugarcoat the great mistake Aaron has made in bending to what the people want. Sin against God is sin. It doesn't benefit anybody to ignore it or pretend, ah, oh, no big deal. Lah. In fact, it leads to death for all the parties involved. And this includes Aaron himself. To give in to them is to be an accomplice to their sin. Accomplice to their sin. A partner. 
A passive stance to sin is condoning sin. And condoning sin sends a wrong message that sin does not matter when we keep quiet or we go along with it. So Aaron asked Moses to not be angry and told how the people asked him to make gods to go before them as they didn't know what had happened to Moses. He asked them for gold jewelry and made a calf for worship out of what they gave him. So Aaron admits his failure. He allowed the people to run wild. Still, he downplays the seriousness of their sin by talking about how prone they are to evil. So his own involvement is simply giving them what they want. You see how we can give excuse? I give them what they want. You know, they're prone to evil. I give them what they want. We can take a position like Aaron by producing grace, nah, you know, grace. Cliches like, I'm only human. I'm a sinner saved by grace. So it's easy if I'm prone to sin, I actually commit sin. As if all the wrongs we do don't matter. Aaron has not made a stand to rebuke, correct and discipline them, but has actually done something that facilitates, allows their idol worship to happen. It is wrong for a leader or older Christian to agree with or to lead others into sin because they ask for it. When we, because Moses said it's a great sin. When we know that people want something that is wrong or take the attitude that grace gives us the chance to continue disobeying God and being sinful, it is our responsibility not to give in to them. Okay? Responsibility not to give in to them or their unbalanced beliefs and attitudes. Indeed, it is hard to stay holy according to God's standards. You can see, huh? Hard to stay holy according to God's standards. But still, God wants the standards to be upheld and maintained. And this is being righteous, not self-righteous. And this is not being judgmental. You know, people like to throw the accusation, you're being judgmental or you're unloving. These labels that many hard-hearted people use as a counter to hit back intimidate and silence those who pluck up the courage to speak up against their wrong. Okay, it looks like we have still got quite one page to go through, but I my time is up. I will have to stop here, okay? Uh, any burning thing you want to ask before I pray, before I close? Any burning question you want to ask or share? Okay, if not, then I will just close with prayer. Um, thank you for your patience. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word speaks to us and your word confronts us uh, how we need to be convicted of staying firm and staying right, uh, even when others around us give us pressure or they want us to be somehow involved in the wrong that they engage in or want to do and they want to get us to be involved in some way. Help us, O oh Lord, to see the seriousness that Aaron did not see and help us to see, Lord, that we are allowing people to uh, lead, not just themselves, but other people down the road of destruction. Help us to value people, love people enough to speak up against the wrong and if they choose not to, then we know we have done what we need to do. Thank you, God, for this lesson. May it strengthen our hearts and may it lead us to be obedient to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.